Thank you, Aram. No, this, thanks for the great introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, you know, I see many of you here, many, of, many familiar faces uh, and new people as well. So uh, today we're going to talk about the future of money. Uh, my side of the story is going to be about DeFi, so decentralized finance. And then Scott is going to talk about central bank digital currencies. Uh, these two things don't have to um, you know, be substitute, but they're rather probably complementing themselves uh, going forward. So uh, before we start, uh, I know many of you are uh, young students and probably know about crypto and invest into crypto. I'm going to talk about a few protocols today. And this is not investment advice, so don't just go home and, and buy <laughs> any of those crypto that I'm going to mention here today. Um, so the roadmap for, for today, um, I'm going to briefly talk about centralized finance. This is the financial system as we know it. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the issues with centralized finance and the banking system that DeFi tries to address. Um, we're going to discuss the origins of DeFi, think about Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then we're going to dive into some application of DeFi, such as uh, stable coins, borrowing and lending, and decentralized exchanges. Okay? And then to set the stage for Scott, I'm going to talk briefly about the risks that are involved in uh, DeFi, uh, and uh, that's it. So centralized finance, um, you know, we all know what it is. Uh, some of us might know how the payment system works, although that's pretty complicated. The reason why the payment system is complicated uh, is because you want to solve the double spending problems. So if you want to send digital money to, to, to someone else, uh, nothing prevents me from sending 10 digital dollars to Scott and then send the same $10 to Viram. Centralized finance solves this problem by having a trusted authority. These are banks and intermediaries. So this can become complex in the case in which, for example, we want to send money from two different institutions, then you need uh, corresponding banks, you need reserve with the central banks, you need clearing banks, and all that. That's complicated stuff. Uh, DeFi and blockchain in general tries to solve the double spending problems in a decentralized way. Okay? Second, um, the notion of money, that's really important. Um, Money in our current financial system, for example, think about the dollars, is fiat currency. So the dollar as a legal tender um, is accepted as a method of payments for taxes and debt. So the U.S. government can issue debt in dominated in U.S. dollars. Um, is also issued by a central bank, so the Federal Reserve, uh, you know, supply um, money to the system. And if you think about the intrinsic value of money, uh, it's basically zero unless there is trust in it. So what makes a dollar worth a dollar is the trust that we put in, uh, in, in that bill, right? Uh, when we make exchanges and we use this for transactions. The, I'm not here to say that the current financial system is inefficient. Uh, in fact, the current financial system, banks provide liquidity. They allocate funds somewhat efficiently and um, also they facilitate payments, okay? But let's think about some of the problems uh, with centralized finance, and this is where DeFi comes in. So the first one is, if you look at this figure that I plotted for you, uh, is the share, the concentration, so the share of deposits that are owned by the top five banks in the United States. Uh, and if you look at this figure, uh, in 2017, 2018, five banks had 50% of deposits. So concentration is really large in the United States and is even larger in uh, less developed countries. Um, that means that interest rates are controlled by just a few banks uh, and are passed to consumers uh, in a way that is not um, quite democratic. There are also high switching costs, so it's really a pain to switch banks. Uh, for example, open and close accounts is, is quite painful. The same idea is true in digital ads. If you think about Amazon, Facebook, Google, uh, concentration is pretty high. The second issue is that if you look at the world, uh, 1.7 billion people in the world are unbanked, so they don't have a bank account, uh, which means that out of about 6 billion adults, uh, that's approximately 30%. Okay? 
But also, almost half of those are in just seven countries. Okay, so seven countries in the world made up for more than 50% of the unbanked. Okay, so this is a big problem because uh, you know, we know that finance can allocate resources on those in needs to uh, those who need to actually invest to, to create economic growth. And so we need the financial system and we need everybody to have a bank account. But also, even if you have a bank account, um, it's really hard to get a loan, okay? And that happened to me when I moved to the United States. I didn't have a FICO score, and it, you know, it, it, it took me years to, to build my credit score, okay? This one happened with DeFi, because uh, all you need to do, uh, you have some, have some collateral, and you'll be able to borrow, and we're going we're gonna to look at that later on. The problem with the current financial system is that if you don't have access to credit from a bank, the only way you can take on project is through credit card debt or payday lending, which is pretty expensive, meaning that if the cost of, um, if the cost of, um, of borrowing is about 20%, 15 to 20%, you will forego positive NPV project. That limits economic growth, okay? Third, let's look at the, the fees charged by credit cards. And we know that uh, there's some academic research that has um, estimated that over the last 150 years, the cost of a financial transaction has been 2% across 150 years. So that hasn't changed. We haven't moved on from the 2 to 3% transaction cost rule. And this is the same for uh, credit cards. So this is a plot of the credit, average credit card fees charged to the merchant. Uh, by credit card companies, uh, and it's about you know two one and a half to two and a half percent. That's been decreasing over time because of uh, fintech, but it's been pretty substantial. And guess what? These costs are passed to consumers, so to us. Okay. So with this in mind, uh, there are also other problems with the current financial system, but I'll, I'll, I won't discuss them here. Let's talk about the origins of DeFi. So. Well, we all know that, that you know, the, the most important uh, uh, decentralized application is Bitcoin, um, which was created in 2008 by Satoshi Nakamoto. But there are many more uh, protocols that were kind of created uh, in the early 90s. One of those were, was uh, DigiCash. And I didn't know that, but some folks in the room might know uh, the only bank that has ever allowed DigiCash payments was... Uh, Mark Twain Bank in St. Louis in the 90s. So Missouri was the only state that used this electronic cash payment system before DigiCash went bankrupt in 1998. Okay, so Bitcoin. Uh, I'm going to be brief here just to give you an overview. Um, Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. It means that you can transfer money between two parties without the need of a financial institution. So you don't need banks. That's the key innovation. How do you achieve that? How do you solve the double spending problem if there's no counterparty uh, or there's no intermediary checking the balances? Um, well, cryptography uh, comes to our rescue. We have hashing and digital signature. These are part of the problem, and I'll discuss uh, some of those later on. But proof of work is what really makes Bitcoin unique. Uh, and, you know, the new technology and the new blockchains. I will discuss what proof of work is uh, later on. Bitcoin also um, talks a little bit about blocks and chains of blocks. Uh, interestingly enough, Bitcoin, uh, you know, the white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto doesn't really talk about blockchain itself. It you know, only it talks about blocks and chain. But nowadays, the media talks a lot about blockchain. Uh, blockchain is basically a time stamping mechanism, Okay so that you can basically append blocks one next to the other and have a ledger that um, has all the, all the transactions that are going on um, in the system. And finally, Bitcoin is distributed, meaning that it's open source. Everybody can run the Bitcoin core. That's the software that basically validates transactions. As long as you have an internet connection, you can do that. Okay, so it's open source. Everybody can inspect the code. Everybody can be a miner and I will discuss some of that later, okay? This is the first block. So the first block uh, in 2009, Bitcoin was created uh, out of thin hair, right? The price of Bitcoin was zero 
at uh, when the first block of transaction was mined, meaning was created. This is the first account that was ever created, the first wallet that was ever created uh, in 2009. So um, the block rewards, which, which is the reward that you get to mine a coin, was 50 bitcoins in 2009. It was mined by someone unknown, and people think that it has to do with Satoshi Nakamoto. 50 bitcoins was the reward. Those bitcoins, as of today, are still unspent, because we don't know who Satoshi is, and, and so this was unspent. These bitcoin now are worth three and a half million. Okay, so 50 bitcoins worth zero in 2009 are now worth three and a half million. The first transaction, in, from a consumer standpoint of bitcoins, this is Reddit. Uh, this guy named Laszlo uh, you know, wrote on, on, on Reddit, I'll pay 10,000 bitcoins for two pizzas. Okay, it'll, you know, it was very specific. I like things like onions, pepper, sausage, mushrooms, no weird fish topping. Pays 10,000 bitcoins for two pizzas. At the time, that was 50 bucks. Now, the guy would have paid 600 million. Okay, in, uh, in, for two pizzas, okay? So in order to understand how Bitcoin and blockchain works, we need to understand briefly about uh, cryptography. So cryptography is just a branch of mathematics that deals with the secure transfer of data. So if I want to securely transfer data, I need a way to do that without that data being intercepted by someone else, okay? So the question is, Matteo and Scott wants to communicate together without being understood by other people. We cannot use English, because otherwise, uh, you know, the 200 of you will understand what we're saying. So the solution is cryptography. So this is a very basic example, but it kind of makes, um, you know, the, the point, gets to the point. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to send Scott some instructions. I'm going to send my plain alphabet, A to Z. And I'm going to send Scott a key, a cipher. That's the key he's going to use to decipher my message. Okay? So it's pretty easy to spot that what, I'm, what, I've, what I've done here, I shifted each letter left to spaces, right? So C becomes an A, H becomes an F, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to send Scott my message. I ciphered that message. I encrypted I'm going to tell Scott F, G, Q, A, M, R, R, which doesn't make sense, but Scott knows the key and is going to decipher my message in plain text. Okay, so it's hi, Scott. The problem, trust. Scott maybe doesn't trust me. I'm going to sell the key to someone else for money so that everybody can intercept our messages and, and you know, and those are bad actors. Uh, these used to happen a lot in history. If you look at you know, the Roman Empire, uh, this is how cryptography was first invented. Okay? Bitcoin is encrypted by default, but what makes Bitcoin really secure and what kind of solves the digital sp uh, double spending problem is hashing. So what is hashing? You probably heard a lot about hashing um, you know, by reading the news. Hashing are just a set of functions, so any mathematical function that you take any input of any size, could be data, could be transa transaction values, could be plain text. You apply the hash function, it's just a mathematical function, and the output you get is a string of numbers and letters, okay, of the same length, okay? That's really key. You put any input in, you can write as much as you want here. You can write a full book. The ash will be a 256-bit length, okay? What is the key here and why this is really used a lot and extensively in blockchain? If you change a minor letter to your data, for example, I'm going to replace the capital H with a small h, the ash will change dramatically, okay? So a small change to the input will change the output dramatically. Okay. Also, it's impossible to go back from the output to the input. So you can only go from the input to the output. Okay. 
So the only way to find out that the ash B94E9 refers to hello world is to try every possible combination of words in the universe, which is impossible, okay? That's what makes Bitcoin really secure. How does blockchain work? So transactions in Bitcoin are broadcasted to nodes. This is what makes Bitcoin distributed. You have a lot of nodes. These are just computers all over the world that they run the Bitcoin software, okay? They broadcast transactions to the network. Some nodes will group transactions into a block. That's just for efi efficiency purposes. You, you put all transactions in one block. So that's your data. The work of the miners is to make sure that Bitcoin is secure. What are they going to do? They're going to find one number that's called the nonce. It's just a number from one to infinity that whenever you add that nonce to the full block, so this is my full block number one, whenever I add that nonce and I hash the block, so I apply the hash function, the resulting output starts with a bunch of zeros. So in this case, you can see that the nonce number three is wrong, right? Because the output doesn't start with zeros. Miners try to find that nonce. It's, you know, the media says it's a complex mathematical puzzle, but it's really not. You have a computer, you use your CPU power, and you can find that in, you know, in no time. So I did the same. I mined that block. The nonce that makes the output starting with four leading zeros is... 72,608, okay? So why do we need that in Bitcoins to make it secure and to reach consensus? The idea is that whenever transactions are broadcasted to the system, they're grouped into blocks. How do we know that those transactions are valid? How do we know which transaction came first? Well, blocks are put out there, and miners will compete to find that nonce. It's a computationally ex expensive work. That's called proof of work. The word suggests that it's exactly you're proving that you're doing a lot of work. Okay? It's you're spending a lot of power, a lot of energy, a lot of time to do that. Okay? Why would you do that? Well, you get rewarded. That's the miner's coin base. You get rewarded with bitcoins to do that. Okay? Why do we need proof of work? And that's the key to understanding bitcoin. Well, let's look at this blockchain. It's only two blocks. Block one, we have a bunch of transactions. And block two, uh, we have, again, a bunch of transactions. Block one is validated, so someone has found the nonce that make the ash starting with a bunch of zeros. Okay? The key with Bitcoin is look at the second block. How do we make sure that the, the ledger is tamper-proof, meaning that Anyone can go in and change numbers and say, uh, Elizabeth paid Jane $4,270. Anyone can go in and, and change that number. But if you do that, the ash will change. The second block has the previous ash in the block. So this ash here is the same as this one. But if the ash in the first block changes, it doesn't match anymore with the following one. So you get red in here. Okay? That's how consensus is then not achieved. But since Bitcoin is distributed, everybody is doing proof of work. Everybody can easily validate that the proof of work has been performed. Therefore, consensus is achieved and Bitcoin is secure. Okay? So tampering with the blockchain is basically impossible. Okay? That's the underlying idea, a very simplified idea behind blockchain and how proof of work uh, works. Okay? So we're talking about DeFi here. So while Bitcoin is good as a um, you know, currency to make transactions and make payments, we need Ethereum. We need Ethereum because all DeFi is on Ethereum. So they all run on Ethereum. Okay? All those applications that we're going to discuss a little bit later runs on Ethereum. So Ethereum is a world computer. So that's what it is. It's a computer that everyone can connect to if you have access to, it, to the internet, and you can run application on it. So many of you in this room might have heard about a virtual machine. So for example, if you're, if you're a professor here and you want to use MATLAB or SAS or Python, 
you don't need to install that on your computer. What you can do, you can go on the virtual machine hosted by the University of Missouri and use that software without installing that on your computer, okay? Ethereum works the same way. It's a virtual machine that everybody can, um, can, can get in and, and write, and write uh, applications. So it's not only a payment data, uh, a payment uh, system, but also you can write smart contracts. What are smart contracts? So smart contracts are piece of codes that are invoked by paying Ethereum to a miner. So you gotta pay money to, to invoke a smart contract. That money is called gas, it's a fee that you pay. Uh, and those smart contracts, they can run anything. They can run prediction markets, they can run finance application, they can run if, complex if statements. So if this happens, then this is the output. So they're very complicated, but it can also be very simple. So um, the main difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum is that you can run smart contracts on Ethereum, okay? Meaning that Ethereum is scalable. That's the big drawback of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just usable for transactions and as a currency. Ethereum is really scalable. That's the potential of Ethereum and decentralized finance, okay? Without getting into the details here, um, DeFi. So DeFi, let's define it. DeFi is an ecosystem of blockchain-based financial instruments designed in a decentralized way, so without banks. So that's the key of all we're talking about. We don't need trusted counterparties. We, not, we don't need trusted intermediaries, okay? So it's decentralized. DeFi is decentralized. It runs on smart contracts. The easiest way to understand smart contracts is to consider a vending machine. You put money in it, you want a kit cut, the machine will give you the kit cut and the appropriate change. That's it. There's no one in between you and the machine that makes the decision for you. It's completely automated, okay? That's a smart contract. Another easy way, I think, to understand how the Ethereum um, protocol works is to compare that to Apple ecosystem. So you all know about Apple. You have the iPhone uh, hardware, okay? And then you have iOS. That's the platform layer. And then you have all the apps, right, on the Apple Store. Ethereum is exactly the same. The infrastructure is the internet. You need to use the internet to use Ethereum. The platform layer is Ethereum itself. So the blockchain, the proof of work, and the smart contracts, and the application are the decentralized apps, the DeFi that we're going to talk about today. Finance, gaming, technology, arts, collectible, etc. Some of the services that DeFi provides, uh, coming from finance, these are you know, most of the uh, finance applications. We have stable coins, you can lend and borrow, you can trade, you can use decentralized exchanges, prediction markets, lotteries, asset management, insurance, et cetera. So we're gonna discuss three of those today, um, time permitting, okay? The value of money locked into DeFi, zero up to 2020 skyrocket to 80 billion in 2021. So DeFi is fairly new, okay? Let's talk about, in the last five minutes or so, let's talk about a few protocols. These are the building blocks of DeFi, okay? So this is what I want you to, um, you know, to get away with. Maker, so again, this is not investment advice, but Maker is one of the, the largest and most important uh, DeFi uh, on, on Ethereum, why? Well, because crypto is volatile, right? There's a lot of volatility. So how do you build a financial system on something that is really volatile and moves around a lot? You can't really lend and borrow if the underlying collateral or the underlying asset moves around, right? Who wants to lend money or borrow money when your asset, your house goes to zero in one day? You, you don't want to use your house as collateral, right? And nobody wants to lend you money. So Maker steps in. It's a two-token protocol that runs on Ethereum that uh, creates a crypto collateralized stablecoin. 
soft peg to the United States, meaning one coin equal one US dollar, okay? And that's key because that minimizes volatility, right? That's what we want to create a successful financial system, okay? So it resists hyperinflation, it's decentralized, that's, that's the key of all blockchain. One die, that's the, that's the coin, it's called die, uh, it's equal to one US dollar, and it's kind of similar to a collateralized mortgage loan. So suppose you own a house, you don't want to sell your house, but you want to borrow. So you can borrow against the value of the house, right? You use your house as collateral, and you take on a, a debt, okay? This is what MakerDAO does. You create a vault. Basically, you put money into an account, um, usually Ethereum, that's your collateral. The only problem is that you have to over collateralize it. So you gotta put more of that asset than what you can borrow, okay? Now you have your collateral, let's borrow against it. You generate DAI from the collateral, you use that DAI to you know, go on vacation because that die is worth one dollar, one die, right? If you borrow 100, you can spend 100 dollars. So you're borrowing money against your collateral. You have to pay down the debt at some point, plus the interest, and, and finally you can withdraw the collateral. But you see the problem here already. It's over collateralized, the collateral moves around. So it's very risky that the value of the collateral drops below the value of the debt. And there are complications in it. I'm not going to go over uh, what happens, but you know, it gets liquidated and you have to pay penalties, etc. How do you maintain the peg? It's a one-to-one -one peg. You pay a stability fee that's paid on your debt. That's just interest. If you borrow money from the bank, you pay interest on that, that money. That's exactly the same idea. And you also get a saving rate. So if you lend money on the protocol, you can get interest for doing that. That's how the system maintains the peg between the die and the dollar, okay? It's a one-to-one -one peg. You can increase or decrease the interest rates such that market forces will bring the peg down to one. In fact, this is the graph of the die USD peg. At the beginning, it was very volatile, at least, you know, uh, one dollar to one one point oh six, but when DeFi exploded in uh, 2021, the peg is pretty much stable at one dollar. Okay, so it's working perfectly as it should be. Okay, Compound is another protocol that is uh, heavily used in uh, in DeFi. It allows for borrowing and lending. Okay, so. The protocol, again, runs on Ethereum. Everything uh, these days runs on Ethereum, although people are moving to different blockchains such as Solana uh, and Cardano. But uh, the way it works is pretty simple. It's like a bank. You aggregate liquidity, so people like us will supply liquidity to the system, and user can borrow from the pool. Okay? So I put my Ethereum back in the system. Someone else can come in and borrow that Ethereum. Okay? Uh, it's just an efficient way to share risks. Okay. Uh, the key here is that rates are determined by market forces. Okay, so you can put any collateral, you can put Bitcoin, Ethereum, you can put any ERC-20 coins, so any coins that, that runs on Ethereum as collateral, but each token will have a different collateralized ratio because of their different uh, intrinsic risk. Okay. Uh, for example, DAI, you know that it's now stable one-to-one, -one, so the collateral ratio will be lower. You don't need to put as much collateral uh, when, you, when you borrow that, okay? Why would you have a use compound to borrow and lend crypto or money? Well, because you have crypto in your portfolio, right? You all have crypto in your portfolio. You don't want to sell it, right? Because you hope that the value goes up as well as you don't want to sell it and incur taxes. Because as you know, if you sell your crypto at a gain, you gotta pay taxes, okay? The IRS is coming after us. So what you're gonna do, you're gonna lend, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna use compound, you're gonna lend your crypto, you're gonna then borrow more and leverage up. So you're keeping, you're keeping your Ethereum, you're not selling it, uh, and you're also leveraging up. So you're not even paying taxes and you're, you're building a leverage position, okay? Uh, these are the, the key features. Um, 
you're lending and borrowing, so you have borrowing rates and uh, lending rates. This is the picture of what it looks like. So if you have crypto and you want to use Compound, you can do it. It's pretty easy. There's a user interface. You can borrow and lend. If you have crypto sitting in your account, you can lend that crypto to someone else and make, on average, 5% a year just on your crypto sitting in your Coinbase account. Okay? Of course, there are risks involved, obviously. Okay? Uniswap. I'm going to go quick here. Uniswap is a decentralized exchange. It allows for exchanging between tokens. So I'm, I'm going to go quick here because I'm going to leave the stage to Scott. But it's an automated market maker. Everybody is supplying liquidity, and everybody can swap one token for the other. Right? If you want Ethereum, uh, you're going to trade against the Ethereum DAI pair, and you make your swap. Okay? The risk of DeFi, and then, and then we'll, we'll let Scott talk about central bank digital currencies. There are many risks involved with, uh, with DeFi. Okay? Squid Game. We all know about the Netflix show, but probably some of you know about the Squid Token. The Squid Token skyrocketed just two weeks ago by, I don't know what, 500,000% and dropped to zero in one second. Dropped to zero. Okay? So that was a fraud. The, the creator of this token basically disappeared with the money. Okay? So definitely the risk of fraud, we know that uh, it's, it's, it's there. Smart contract. You're basically putting your faith into some developer that writes code, right? There might be some logical error, bugs, for example. There's also some economic exploit. There's also governance risk because, well, the system can become a little bit not democratic um, because we, holder of the coins, are the governance mechanism in place. Okay. Third, well, there's a lot of regulation and a lot of talk going on from the SEC, from the OCC, from the IRS. For example, know your customer, uh, anti-money laundering, and these are all things that connect to the central bank digital currency question that we're going to discuss. Other risks, custodial. If you leave your Bitcoin or your Ethereum in Coinbase, you're subject to hacking. Okay? Or Potentially, you're subject to lost or stolen private key. So the private key is what you use to access your bitcoins, uh, and you can lose that. And finally, I think uh, people, especially our age, are thinking a lot about the environment, are thinking a lot about climate change, and we know that proof of work is, uh, expends a lot of energy. And so many, many uh, new technologies are moving away from proof of work and towards proof of stake. Okay? That requires much less uh, energy. Okay, so I'm going to leave the stage to Scott now. Um, that we'll talk about uh, central uh, banks, digital currencies. Thank you. Thank you.